Hey, race fans, Steve Letard here, your host for NASCAR Inside the Race. Not a post-race edition today, but a science edition. How do cars fly? As long as NASCAR has been racing, cars have been wrecking, and no wrecks are more hair-raising, death-defying, and just crazy to watch than when 3,500-pound race cars leave the racing surface, go in the air, and go for a tumble. I think NASCAR has done a great job of making the cars safer, but safe is probably not the word you should use for anything that goes 200 miles an hour. We'll remind ourselves this the week where we'll see 40 drivers strap in at Talladega that they were willing to do things that normal humans won't do. Three and four wide, knowing the result could be the same. Multi-car X cars going in the air. We're lucky enough today to answer some of those questions. Just how complicated this equation is. I was a crew chief. My job was to make cars fast, not to make cars stay on the ground. Luckily for us, Dr. Eric Jacuzzi from NASCAR is going to come in. He is the aero specialist. He's going to answer all the questions about just how tough it is to figure each and every one of these wrecks out and what needs to be done different in the future. All right, as promised, Dr. Eric Jacuzzi. Uh, Eric, first of all, appreciate you joining. I want to make sure I got this title right because it's impressive. Vice President, Vehicle Performance Innovation Aero. Is that right? Yes. All right, well, you're going to have to translate that. So tell the fan, <laughs> what, what does that mean? Um, for NASCAR, what's your primary role within within the R and D center? Uh, it's kind of a collection of things. So um, my my main focus, my I guess my first love is uh, aero. Um, that's what I started doing at NASCAR um, almost eleven years ago now. Um, and prior to that was working with RCR. Uh, so arrows arrows one of my um, things I watch. And then um, I've got track testing through a couple people. So just kind of facilitating that from our side, uh, managing that, and then um, chassis certifications that happen here at NASCAR R&D, um, and a little bit of data analytics work. So as an analyst, um, some are, easy is the wrong word, right? Some I can explain, how about that? Some I see a car go in the air and I'm like, man, I think I know what happened here. I'm gonna put that to the test today because you might tell me I'm full of crap. But then there's other times that I have a hard time. So I'm gonna start with what I think, this is like the wreck heard around the world. This is one of the most famous wrecks we've seen in, at least in the last 10 years. Uh, I actually got to see this one live. This is Pre's 2023 Daytona back straight away. Not only is a car airborne, but one of the most violent rolls, tumbles, flips. There's a lot of things going into this accident right here. I'm not gonna get the other parts of it. I went and actually looked at the car. There was some crazy parts of the car that stayed intact and looked good. I want to talk about just purely the lift of this. How much of this is aerodynamic and how much of this the grass and the surface in which he's on affecting this car going airborne? In this case, um, it's kind of interesting. We spent a lot of time looking at this. There's a couple things that happened. One was when Ryan's car um, crossed from the grass um, or crossed from the track it hit the lip of the um, bus stop chicane, um, which was protruding about two inches. So we had a pretty significant tire mark there and a chunk of um, asphalt missing. So, so like a ramp, like so basically yes. a ramp. Yeah, and we saw some Z acceleration um, in the uh, incident data recorder. Z being vertical, being the car yes. going up into the air. Yeah, so we saw that get put into the car. And then the other part of it that was kind of interesting that's really hard for us to evaluate, but I I sort of went and looked at some um, helicopter research. And when you hover a helicopter over pavement, you know, the engine power is, let's say, 100. When you f move over to grass, you need 120 or 130. I believe it was 30% more power. And that's because of that surface and like the porosity and everything. So huh. to me, it makes a lot of sense that the grass, um, you know, would would have taken away, we would have lost some of that downforce we had. But I think the primary thing was that transition. And, and part of the reason we think that of, of the importance of him striking the curb was that the car was leaving skid marks on both axles right up until it did that. So it wasn't lifting off the ground before then um so that that was kind of like another um another fact that we used and then that's fascinating so what you're so so i want to make sure the fan heard this and, and make sure i heard it correctly it's not that the grass pushed up on the car it's the grass took away the ability of the car to pull itself down right like yes. the bottom of the car the speed going across the air is like a vacuum cleaner that's the best way i explain it to people right the air going across this floor is going so fast it is 
it is pulling the car on the ground. What you're saying is when you go from asphalt, it's not that the car gets pushed up, it's that what is pulling the car down goes away. So that, exactly. it's kind of like leaning on a cane and me kicking the cane, right? Like you're, it just, you fall that direction, which this just happens to be up, which blows my mind. Um, and then the poor guy, I, I don't know what to say other than snake bit, right? So now you have the priest again. Uh, another, what I call a dirty flip. So if I'm in the booth watching this flip, I don't want to say it makes sense to me, but it kind of does. As a non-aerodynamics guy, right, like the car gets smashed together, the nose goes up in the air, and it kind of shows the bottom of the car like a kite, and it almost blows over, like I think Priest even said, like a piece of plywood. Uh, I mean, on a windy day, is, is it as simple as that? Like, what's the science to this wreck? How much different is this than the other one? Yeah, this one's pretty odd. Um, you know, it reminded me of an unlimited hydroplane um, blowover. But, um, you know, what we saw in this wreck when we analyzed it was the big thing was the priests hitting the 20 coming back across the track. And it looks like that hit was directly on the uh wheel of the 20 so it was a wheel to wheel contact that got the car way up in the air and yeah from that point on you know it's essentially it's essentially uh going 180 190 and it's it's 30 degrees up i mean we can't even actually test that we did do some cfd on this and we looked at if we started removing parts of the floor would this affect anything and it didn't change anything more than a mile an hour or two so kind of I think the only thing that would have saved us there is maybe if like the hood had blown off or something like that. Right, maybe make a that massive would help. change. Yeah, something that would be not practical to um, you know make into a safety device. Um, so yeah, it, it really was just a kind of a freak incident. And then the other thing that um, you'll I'll talk about a lot. We've we've really studied you know sometimes when they're spinning and there's other cars around them they'll do things that you don't expect them to do. And we've found that studying on the computer and CFD, um, the presence of another car, depending on where it is, can really affect that car that's spinning. I wanna to get to some cleaner ones. So when I watched those two, like I said, I was, I was um, on the coverage for the first priest wreck we showed down the back stretch. That was an NBC race in the summer. This, this last one was a Fox race. I thought they did a nice job explaining what could have happened there in the, um, it was in the uh, the Daytona 500, but this is another one that I was on. So I'm gonna before I get this one going. This is Corey LaJoy, Michigan, and here's why I struggle for this one. Before we get it going, so first of all, my own brain, you know, I think of super speedways, Michigan, not a super speedway. So for the race fan who doesn't understand really the definition, there are some details in the car. The big detail is power amount right when you go to daytona talladega and atlanta your re reduction in power is pretty drastic versus like a michigan now overall speed um top speed's got to be d the same michigan perhaps even faster at times is that fair yeah it's very close so this is the seven the secondary car the seven once again if you're on the podcast what i'm doing is showing a replay of of corla joy kind of chasing the 10 down it's kind of an odd accident they barely bang the seven what i call snap spins which is not a slow spin that you know dissipates a ton of speed the car turns left it can't slow down five miles an hour and the thing sideways and then it just lifts so i guess from an aero standpoint, is this purely just raw speed? Is this a car 90 degrees at just a high, high rate of speed? So it's interesting you said that this is, uh, this is the most confusing one because for us, this was the one that made the most sense. So what was happening at Michigan that day, Corey was going about 194 from our GPS when the car went over. Um, the prevailing winds running from turn three to turn two at that time according to the weather service we were using were over 30 miles an hour so basically his airspeed if you will was 224 miles an hour all right so i um, just want to stop i'm going to stop you right there not to interrupt so like because i want to make sure the fans stack this together vehicle 194 miles an hour but but he's going into a headwind Mm -hmm. So that means that the air traveling over the car is north of 225 miles an hour, right? We talk about a lot with handling, back to my world as a crew chief, right? 
in into headwind, you have a ton of downforce because, man, the air is going 200-something miles an hour. It's pushing your car into the ground. Tailwinds are the opposite. So you're telling me that the airspeed is north of 225. Yeah. And okay. when we, at the time that this, in the configuration this car is in, um, when we go to the wind tunnel um, and we do this testing at uh, the General Motors Aerodynamics Laboratory up in uh, Warren, Michigan, um, we basically had 224, uh, or I think it was 222 listed as what at the yaw angle this car blew over. That was what we had measured the last time we were there. So when you when we spin the car in the wind tunnel you kind of get this plot of like different speeds that it wants to lift off at and it changes depending on the exact angle so we really spend a lot of time looking at like what was the exact angle it went over but that one you know we calculate i think we said about 80 degrees of yaw from from straight ahead and that 80 degrees like we went to that point on the plot and we said well i mean the answer is like staring right at us right so i say this all the time i i have if anybody wants to see me almost cry perhaps was crying there's a couple great youtube clips where i run out of gas on top of the pit box and i tell everybody all the time damn you math damn you like you ran out of gas (laughs) right where i thought it was going to run out of gas so basically what you're saying is is it doesn't make sense without the wind right because like so now i'm up in the tv booth i'm like man it's 195 miles an hour the car's going 190 but you're saying in retrospect, when you add the wind in and you look what happened and you look at all the data, you say to yourself, well, our testing is accurate because that's where the car should have had the opportunity to blow over. Yeah. And um, I kind of, you know, it's good to point out too the you can see from our side how if we do something just for super speedways, um, you know, in my opinion, it's always better if the safety devices are across every racetrack right you know obviously i Martin's- agree for the guy who has to explain them amen mm-hmm. if they run yeah. them everywhere it's better for all of us but yeah so we um you know we we didn't just come up with this conclusion and uh you know present it to everyone and then say okay we're done um you know we've been uh working for about six months um on a new aero device um that is very 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 effective um so basically it was a 40 to 50 percent increase at 90 degrees um it's a new flap that's going to be on the a post um we're still working through some details you got some testing to make sure it's physically strong enough we ran it on track um at michigan actually um at the tire test just to see what it would do needed to make some changes out of that but yeah, uh, that that we're planning on a Daytona too. Um, so the uh, summer race, we would have that ready, and it's it's strictly a matter of time. We had some engineering to do. It started out as a concept that wasn't really viable, and then we, you know, had a couple brainstorms and sort of came up with this idea. Um, and yeah, it it proved to be very very effective. We last had it in the wind tunnel um, in February. We went up to uh, GM for a couple days, um, and then. Since then, we've been working on getting the production version prepared. It's fascinating stuff. Um, I, I enjoy these conversations. I'm thankful we got to do this conversation for the fans to watch because you and I have a lot of coffee conversations in, um, in the NASCAR trailer where I, I uh, lean on you a lot from the information I use on television. So I appreciate I appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, I'm thankful for the work you're doing and continuing doing. Um, I'm hoping I can convince you to come back. I know this wasn't the best topic in the world when you talk about cars flying. I know it, <laughs> it takes a tremendous amount of your effort, um, and I appreciate that effort, but hopefully we can have you back another time where you talk about maybe downforce or drag or some of the cool other vehicle dynamics that we get to see on the racetrack. Well, folks, it's been another NASCAR Inside the Race. I appreciate you listening on the podcast or watching here on YouTube. As always, subscribe to the NASCAR channel. Listen in. Um, and get your podcast wherever you get your podcast. NASCAR Inside the Race each and every week. And this week, post-Talladega, me, Kim Kuhn, Jeff Burton, will break down exactly what happens at NASCAR's Biggest Oval.